So for today, um, I want to go quickly over um, how to style this contact us form with Bootstrap, right? So if we remember, so if you would, please pull this project up. Um, I have mine as number four. You'll probably just have yours as, as contact us. That's perfectly fine. So question, what's the first thing I need to do to get this converted over to Bootstrap? The Bootstrap CD. Yeah, the CSS for the Bootstrap. Okay, the CSS for the Bootstrap. Where can I get that? Uh, bootstrap. I mean, get bootstrap.com. Okay, so let's go out there, get bootstrap.com, and let's go download it. Um, again, I could do this as a CDN. I could do this as download. Um, either one is really fine, but I'm going to go ahead and do this as a download. So go up here, download. Uh, we'll want the compiled files. If you go get the source files, as they're listing here, those are the original file those are going to be in SAS, right? So those you'd need to have, have SAS set up to use. Um, but So we're going to use what we call the, the compiled ones here. Okay, so I'm going to hit download. Okay, now there's a bunch of files in here that I'm going to need. Now, one thing, remember we talked about yesterday, that you could do a drag and drop. So let's say I've, I've opened up this file. I haven't I haven't extracted it, right? This is this is kind of the important thing to note. Um, so I downloaded Bootstrap as a zip. What happens if I try to drag this over? Notice that nothing happens. You see that? You have to unzip the folder. Yeah. So I do have to remember to unzip it because the drag and drop doesn't work if it's coming from a zip. Um, as to why that's not supported, don't ask me. Um, I hope they fix it eventually, but uh, that's just one thing you have to know is you do have to unzip it first to be able to do that. So now I'm in the folder, the unzip folder. Now I can drag in uh, bootstrap.min.js. I want the, the minified version. Okay, and you should see that look like this when it comes in here. You can see how it looks kind of like gobbledygook. That's the minified version. If I were to look at the the not minified version here, you'll see how it's got comments and it's it's quite a bit more readable. Uh, but it's also a bigger file. So what we want is that that minified version. Okay. So I've got that minified bootstrap. I've got the JavaScript. I also need to create a folder for my CSS. Um, so we're going to drag in bootstrap min CSS. Good so far. Okay, so I've got bootstrap min CSS, I've got bootstrap min JS. If I want the other versions, because I may want for every reason to refer to the others, I could bring those in as well. So there'd be the non-minified version and the original version of the non-minified version there as well. But I want to make sure that I'm using the, the minified versions. Okay. So... I've got my CSS files and I've got my JavaScript files. Is everybody there at the same point? Yep. Okay. Um, yep. So where do I need to add my my CSS? Where do I add that Bootstrap CSS file? Yeah, uh, you would put that in the head above your own style sheet. Okay. So and actually. I'm going to ditch my own style sheet because it won't make sense once I bring Bootstrap in. Click 
clear. So I'm going to ditch my own style sheet. Let's open this up in live server just so we can make sure we're looking at it side by side, right? So so now we're back to what it used to look like, right? If I ditch my own style sheet, it looks really ugly. Um, but it's going to be a problem if I had kept that CSS when I brought that in because none of that really makes sense. A lot of that stuff just doesn't make sense with Bootstrap. And part of that is that all of these selectors, you see how many of them are based on the type of tag? Yeah. That's the key problem, is many of those are based on their, their element selectors. Um, if they had been class selectors, um, they would be more than likely, they would potentially be compatible. Um, so that's just one thing to be, be forewarned of. Um, you know, writing your HTML to classes is generally better, especially when you want to integrate other tools, um, versus if you write things to uh, type selectors, um, you're going to have a lot more compatibility issues um, if you move forward. So. Um, some of those aren't avoidable, and but some of those are. So let's go bring in Bootstrap. So what kind of tag do I need? I need a link tag. Um, I need to add in attribute rel style sheet and href is CSS bootstrap min dot CSS. So that's what I need to do to bring in bring in Bootstrap, and you can see immediately that it's changed a few things. Namely, it's changed the the default font and and a few other you know minor tweaks to the layout. But to actually get it to look good, I do need to go do some more work. Now, if you're bringing this in from the CDN, are those the only two properties that you need to set? Rel and href. No, what you also need uh, cross origin and something else. Mm -hmm. Cross origin and something else. Why is that? Why do I need those settings? It's so that if someone downloads something to the main server, it doesn't break everything on your end as well. So that's the that's the hash. What's cross origin for? Specifically, what's cross origin anonymous? Anybody remember? Doesn't tell it not is to that? include any login credentials. It says not to send the login credentials. Right. So it doesn't send any cookies or login credentials to the, the website it's downloading things from. So anytime so, you have resources that are coming from a CDN, you need to make sure that you include both of those properties. It's critical that both of those properties um, are included if you're pulling it from a CDN um, for a security purposes. Um, so. so it's hacker protection. It's no. hacker protection. Um, they don't, that's not a big deal if they're resources you're hosting yourself, uh, but it is a big deal if it's resources somebody or ho somebody else is hosting. Now, it's still not a bad idea. You don't need the hash if you're hosting it yourself. It's not that, because that's not a big issue as much. You can still include it even if you're hosting it yourself. Um, but, I, but it's still worth potentially putting in cross origin anonymous for the style sheet, even if you're hosting it yourself, simply so that, um, it, again, it doesn't need to send those login credentials when it's getting a, a CSS file, right? Because that should be something that's public. You don't have to log in to get the CSS for a website, right? So it's still it's still recommended that you would add that even if you're hosting the files yourself. Okay, so that's the CSS. What else do I need to add for for Bootstrap? JavaScript. JavaScript, right? Yep, so I need to add the JavaScript, and where do I need to add it in this order of things? 
Do I add it first before the jQuery? Do I add it after the jQuery? Do I add it before or after before the contact? JQuery. Before jQuery? The JavaScript, yeah. So let's say I do it that way. That's what you're saying, right? Add it first. Right. But does the order here matter? Does does Bootstrap depend on something? Okay, put it under it. <laughs> right. So so Bootstrap does at least in the current version that we're using, version four point five does rely on jQuery. Um, so jQuery does need to be before Bootstrap and then our our custom JavaScript needs to be after Bootstrap and um, because we're likely to eventually need to call some some methods in Bootstrap. So we want to make sure that we we run those in that order. Um, Popper is also one that you generally want to add. It, it does depend a little bit on what you're building. So, so Popper is not used for everything in, in jQuery. Uh, Popper kind of creates these, these tool tips is what it originally is designed for. So you need it for one of two things. If you're using any sort of the, the tool tip bits in Bootstrap, um, or if you're using modals specifically, then you do need Popper. Um, but if you're not using either of those two things, then you you don't have to you don't have to bring in popper. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're building. So some features rely on popper, some features don't. Um, a lot of features don't. Okay. So if I'm working my way from the top to bottom, okay. So the first thing I would want to do to bootstrapify my form is I'm going to add class form to the form first. That's what I would do first. Okay. Is everybody with me? Yeah. Have I yeah. lost anybody yet? Okay. So we're going to add class form to the form tag. Beneath that, the next thing I need to do is I need to actually group all of the, the sets of like labels and inputs. Um, also, if you have error inputs, they also need to go into that same group. So here I'm going to add a, a div, or I think I can do, what was it, div dot um, form group, I think will give it, give me a, yeah, that's what I want. Um, div dot form dash group will give me the tag with the class. So I need to put these into each of these sets, each of these groups of controls into a form group. Okay, And that will then, as you see, it will start to, to break them up into groups so that they're arranged vertically. Um, the other thing I need to do in there, um, it, the other thing I might do in there is, is quickly add a div for the error boxes. right? So if I potentially wanted to put an error under the field, I would need some sort of placeholder for that. What's up, Evan? I was just trying to private message you, but I jumped, jumped into your screen stream anyway, so. Hey. <laughs> hey. hey, everybody. Hi, hey, Mr. G. How's it going? Uh, good. I was just talking with Shannon based on what we talked about earlier, so just had an update for you. Okay. Yeah, so I'll just shoot you a message, and okay. you can respond respond later. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Hi and bye, everybody. Hey. Hi, bye. Hi, bye. Hi, bye. So I might want to add some sort of error message placeholder for if I do want to show an error message with each field um, and that I would need to make sure it goes into each of the form groups um, so I want to go through each of these controls and, and add that add that form group
Um, don't forget after you add these, I would highly recommend doing a quick uh, right click format document on it um, just to fix up any indentation issues that this might introduce um, as you're adding in these additional tags. Um, so format document. So one thing you, you don't have to do, but I often find useful, um, you don't have to put your buttons down at the bottom in a form group, um, but I usually find that it makes my, my styling a lot easier if I do put my buttons in a form group, even though that isn't required. Also makes it usually easier to read and work with. Is everybody with me? Is anybody still typing? Uh, I am. Do we need to be coding along with you? Uh, please do. I mean, that's part of why we're doing this is is to try and show you how to do this. Um, it's, trying to do this as a hands-on example. It's just very hard to do one one laptop for me to switch yeah. back and forth. Okay. Well, I guess that's that's true. Um, yeah, if you're only having one screen. Um, do you want me to code along with you as we're going, or do you just want me to watch? Because Then just watch. If it, I, I didn't think about that, and that's my fault. Um, if you only have one screen, yeah, that, that might be an issue. So. All right. Okay, so that's how we're going to convert that. We'll need to put everything into groups. Um, and so once we kind of look at, if you look at how that is in the browser right now, you'll see rather than it kind of running all along on one line, you see what that form group's done. It's gone ahead and, and laid everything out so at least it's, it's vertically grouped um, together. Now... To some degree, you don't necessarily have to have the form group to have that behavior because simply adding a div in there, right, is going to go ahead and give you that behavior where things are arranged vertically. Um, so that's not a necessarily a bad approach, even if you're not using, if you're using something other than, than Bootstrap or you weren't using Bootstrap, it's still good to group your, your controls that way because um, it does make working with them easier. Okay, so we're going to group all those controls. What class do we need to, does anybody remember what class we need to add to our actual inputs? The, like, form control? Be form control. Yep, so in this, in here, I'm going to give this a class, form control. Um, there's enough properties there that if I, I format, I would expect it to drop down. But I guess it hasn't. So I've got form control added at to the end of that. And you see what's what's you see what's happened in the browser when I added that form control. You see how this field is different. Yeah. So it's made it look a lot nicer. Here we're kind of starting with the out of the box styling of your controls, um, of your inputs. You'll, if you've used forms in different um, browsers, you might know that the default styling of forms is actually quite different, is quite different between uh, browser to browser. So this takes care of eliminating a lot of those differences so your, your forms look the same way regardless of what browser the user uses. Um, so definitely make sure that you mark all of your inputs with that form control class. So I'm going to go do that on, on all of these. I don't know if you like to do it, but you could put on word wrap. That way it just falls down when it runs off the screen. If you go to settings... I don't do that uh, simply for the reason that it it makes it look different than what it actually is. Um, it makes it look, look like there's a break there when there isn't a break. Um, and that tends to be a problem. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. So, because sometimes your your white space does matter. So I, I'd rather have it be the same way that the code is originally. Now I might have missed this, but um, form group is like something we want to put around our forms all the time, right? Yep, absolutely. So every form you're going to add, you're going to add form group for each of those, and then form control. You want to make sure you add that on each of your um, controls. I want to. I want to start a political group called White Space Matters. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> So, so those are the, that's kind of your starting point, right? Now, one question, do I, should I add form control to my buttons? I, I was actually going to ask that question, like, is that something you should? So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to add form control to my send button. That's what my send button looks like now. Does it look like my send button is a text field? Yes. It does, right? So form control will make anything you apply it to look like a text field. Do I want my buttons to look like a text field? No. No. Okay. Another exception to that form control rule, what about checkboxes and radio buttons? Do I want those to look like text boxes? Probably not. Probably not. So, so form control, I don't want to apply to buttons. I don't want to apply it to check boxes. I don't want to apply it to radio buttons. Um, but pretty much everything else, anything that looks like it should be a text field, should get the form control class. And that includes um, your drop downs. If you have a select, um, that should have a, a form control class. Now, given that, um, the classes that I do need to add to the buttons are BTN and then the color of the button. So, so generally our OK button, our primary button, we want to be BTN primary. It's part of where, where the, the word primary comes from. It's your primary color and it's usually your primary button, your OK button or your submit button. Now, what could I set the, um, the reset button to though? What color? Uh, danger. Danger. B why would I? Why would I want to set that one to danger? Because red means dead, and if they're like entering stuff into the thing, and they want to reset the page, like all their stuff is basically just gone. That's a right. big mess up. Danger will get rid of everything. So, so we want to give there some inclusion that it, uh, some indication that that is a a button that they may not want to click. Um, so yeah, danger would be a good color here. If I were to set this to secondary, which is kind of the, the other one, oftentimes we'll use, like if it's the other button, well, that makes it look gray. But if I look at this, I don't think, you know, that doesn't look like reset to me, right? That doesn't scream to me that the reset is going to happen if I click that. You with me? Mr. Smith, why? Mm -hmm. What's up with the primary and secondary? Why not just have it be button blue? I mean, what, what were they after? Just standardization across all websites? So you can you can change the primary color. That's why. You can change the primary color. In SAS. In SAS. Um, there's also kind of a, a hacky way to do it um, directly in your CSS. Um, so... It, you can actually technically change it um, without going all the way to SAS. If you open up the Bootstrap CSS file, um, you'll see it actually starts with this here, right? You see all these variables? Um, these are actually what we call CSS variables. These are not SAS specific. Um, so you'll notice that there's a color called primary here. Oh, right, but you wouldn't change it there because we're using the minified version. I wouldn't change it there, yeah, because I'm using the minified version and I don't want to touch either of those files anyway. Um, but I could create my own style sheet. So let's say I create um, my, my main.css. So new file main.css. And... So let's say I want to change the primary color to another color. What 
what what color what color should I use for my primary color? Somebody give me a different color other than blue. Purple. Purple. Okay. Magenta. So let's let's go in here. If we hover over the color, you can kind of see in in uh, VS Code it'll give you this thing. So I can kind of drag around, and now I have purple. So I have purple in here. All right. So let's link in that that main CSS. I'll copy this into Discord so everybody has a copy if you are following along. I would just like to bring up the discussion that mm -hmm. when we said purple, you instantly went for a very dark shade of purple. Uh huh. And that's not what my like ideal of purple would have been. Been like this one? <laughs> no, I mean like in the middle. Like you went dark. I was thinking like Barney kind of maybe colored. Yeah. I just picking one off of the off of the top of what's available. So, anyway, just, I don't know. It just it it was a theory in my brain. I was like, that's what he considers purple. Hmm. <laughs> so so you can you the the right way generally if you want to get really into the weeds and and and, and mess with the sat mess with bootstrap oftentimes you want to get into and, and change the sass. Um, but a lot of these things you can actually just quickly change by just overriding some of these variables. So let me just add that in here. I've linked it in my, I've linked that in my HTML file. And if I go back to the browser, um, what am I missing? Uh, I tried it too, it didn't work for me. Didn't work for me. I know I've done this in the past, so what am I missing? Primary, main. Maybe important. Maybe. Is it linking it in? So let's go, let me hit F12 on this. Failed to load resource, favicon not found. So it didn't say that it failed to load it. It's linking a CSS, main CSS. What did I do? What did I do wrong? I'm doing something wrong. I know I have done this before. Exactly that, and even without the important. I don't know why. Why is it not working this time? I've got them in the right order. What happens if I change the order? Nope, so that's definitely not what it is. I may have to investigate that further. Because I could swear that... I know I've done that before. I know I've overridden that, overridden that variable, but I don't know why that's not applying yeah okay well besides the point I'll have to maybe look into that deeper as to why that's not working but blue is the one that you start with um, as being the one in the default theme um, you remember that I mentioned you can get other themes out at Bootswatch Um, so these are all customized, and some of these have blue as the primary, but not all of them. So for instance, here you can see this one's got a red as the primary. Um, this one, Lux, has got a black as their primary, etc. Um, this one does have a purple. So you, you can change that um, to be a different color. It's just blue by default. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Can I go to the bathroom, please? Absolutely. Bruh. <laughs> I don't know what I would do to stop you. Um. <laughs> Why was that the most perfect bra, though? Like, who said that? What was that? Sheridan, you should go ask if you can make a sandwich. Yeah, yeah, I'll be right on back. I'll just go into the kitchen where I belong. Dang. 
That's mean. That's just low. Anyway, so so primary and secondary, by default, they're blue and gray. There's not really any reason that they need to be that, though. That's just what they have picked as the default. Does that that answer that question basically it's like it's just the default yes yeah I, I knew that it just seems like there should be a better way like blue or red instead of text primary right but it the important thing is not that it's blue the important thing that it is is that it's the primary color the primary color in your color palette it doesn't really represent blue. Um, if you want it to be specifically blue, then you just make your own, you know, your own class that that is that. Make your button blue class, and then then it will be blue. Um, but the point of using primary over using blue is it allows you to retheme it, put a different theme onto it. It's also why we say danger instead of we say red, right? Because we could have said blue and, and, and blue and red here, uh, but if we say primary and danger, it becomes more, it can, becomes easier to theme it. Okay. Um, Mr. Just, I just had a little minor question about, yep. I, was, I don't know if I download everything as, um, you know, all the links and everything is, I was keeping, uh -huh. keeping up, but. Do you link the Bootstrap CSS and the Bootstrap .min CSS, or just just one? Just one, just one. Don't don't absolutely don't link both. Now the min CSS it's the same thing. You just you just put the CS the Bootstrap CSS to show us stuff, I guess. Yeah, it's it's the same thing. So we're going to use the minified version. The only difference between the two is one is the the minified is is, is a smaller file versus the, the unminified is, is a bigger file. But they both have the same and now, text in them. And now why can't I just go in and change that primary there? And let's say I let's say I just linked it to the bootstrap CSS instead so I could read it. And then just went and changed the primary color in there. What's is that such a bad sin? It is a very bad sin. What would happen as soon as you want to go up to say bootstrap this is four point five two what if I want to go up to bootstrap four point five three because there's a fix I really, really need. Would I still have all those customizations that I made? Uh huh. I see you've got the big picture, and I got the little bitty picture. That's the big picture. The big picture is you're eventually going to need to update Bootstrap to a newer version. So if you go change either of any of these files, any of these files that you have from a third party library, you're going to prevent yourself from being able to update to the newest version. So don't touch it. If you're if you're getting this as what we call third party code, don't don't do anything with it. Just take it as is. When they uh, okay. When they what? Um, canceled the question. Never mind. I had a couple question, but I forgot. Yeah. Okay. Um, also of note, if you're using the the files from Bootswatch, those directly replace the the file from Bootstrap directly replaces this CSS. So you're going to use that file instead of the one from the Bootstrap website if you're using a Bootstrap theme, Bootswatch theme. Okay, so we've got that. Um, what else is remaining? Okay. So we've got all the, the forms laid out, um, and it looks fine. It looks okay as far as a mobile would be concerned. Um, what might I want to do to make this work better on desktop? Well, uh, the fields don't need to be that big, so I would... They don't need to be that big, right? Print the, the width uh, across the line, maybe like 500 pixels. But how would you do that? And you're just you're just throwing a number out there, finer pixels. Uh, yeah, um, put it in, surround the form with a fluid container. Okay, or 
well, um, specifically a container. Um, if you do container fluid, container fluid always, is always 100% wet. So if I put it in a container fluid, it won't be any different than what it is right now. So Or just a container, yeah. dot container. So I'm going to put a div in here. Uh, maybe I do div dot container. And I don't know what, uh oh, I'll just have to write it out. Div class container. That's what I want to put here. And I'm going to put the ending tag all the way after the form, but before my scripts format. So, so putting in that, that container um, is going to mean that it's not always the full width of the page. It's going to dynamically change it based on the size of the viewport um, to only fill up part of the page. And you can see it's centered now. <coughs> Any questions? Not necessarily, but tell you what, I really want that sandwich now that someone recommended it. <laughs> and, and you can also see you now on the smaller screen size how containers also given it a little bit of padding on the a little bit of uh, margin padding on the outside between the, the actual fields and the edge. Okay. Now, is this a complete form? Does the does the user know if they're looking at this page what the purpose of this form is? There's no title. There's no title, right? So so we need to make sure that we have one at the top. Um, because there's not one currently, I can just make that an H1. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put that inside of the form. So H1 here, and make that contact. I probably should have remembered to put that on the other forms, but I didn't. Other versions. Okay. So that's kind of the 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 way you you bootstrapify it. So what are the what are the classes that you need to remember to add? Container and form control. Container, form control. What else? Form group. Form group. Anything else? A title? Button classes, then the colors. Mm -hmm. Yep, so the button classes. Um, so that's that's how I'm going to switch that over to, to Bootstrap. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's a good point to leave that off here. Um, and I think let you guys get back to lab work. Um, are there any questions or things that you need um, for our, for the login or the register forms? Uh, perhaps as I get into them, I'll have some questions, but not not the moment. Okay. Uh, Vincent, you had a had a question. No, I was just going to say no. I guess no, because nobody's talking. I'll be honest, I don't really know what the form group class accomplishes. Um, so it groups the controls together. Um, the biggest one that it comes into is if I switch this, you see I've got it as form right now on the on the actual form tag. Um, if I switch this to form inline, watch how all of this changes. So form inline, kind of the attempt is to try to get it to all appear horizontal. But the form group keeps the those groups of things together if you have a horizontal form. Part of the thing that lets you do, remember going back to the whole point of, of having this stuff in here makes it easier to theme. 
So by having the form groups in there, I now have something I can target with CSS. Okay, I guess a form group. So, because here we, we put a little form group div around each item. Yeah. But really, I would like if it were me, I would put full name and, and uh, email address together in a group. Yeah, don't. maybe zip code and subject in a group or something, you know, like you would group different controls together, different inputs, no? No, the, the expectation is the form group needs to be around each uh, pair of like label and um, each label and field. Oh, label and field is a group. Oh, label and field okay. is a group. Label and a field is a group. So like what if I what if I had a what if I had an address where I wanted the guys street address and city and zip code? Wouldn't that all be a big form group of three things? No, you would put that in a field set. Uh, a field set is not I, the same thing as a form group. Right. Form group is to just group the pair of, of label plus basically label plus field plus error message. These are the three things that go in there. So if I have first name, that that's one group. Second name is another group. That's one of those things that did take me a while to kind of work through the, the bootstrap navig the documentation to understand what they meant by it. Um, and, and as it turns out, it's it kind of has to be that way. Because um, I had taken that approach for a while of, of first name and, and last name. Well, those can be in the same group. Um, as it turns out, it, it doesn't really work that way, nor is it intended to be that way. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, now, is the error that I see there, you have an error thing. Should we, should we make our results box um, under each uh, input? Generally speaking, that's good. Um, generally speaking, that's good. If you look at the actual bootstrap documentation, you'll see that there is some some stuff about how to actually do error message because they do have some support for that. Um, so error is just kind of a, a class I'm making up in this case, but there is actually a, a bootstrap class for that. Okay, so you just you just put that in there as a kind of a convention to make sure your form was complete. Yeah, to just give you an example, it's like, well, it's actually going to have those three things normally. 